any band that existed um, in theory, like mm -hmm. if I talked to my friends and they were like, hey, we got a, we got a band together. We just don't have a drummer. I'd be like, you know what? I can I'll play figure it out. I'll play it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Bring me a bad word. So this podcast is all about you, uh, your journey in music. And we'll talk about, uh, of course, the new AFI record, which is coming out on Friday. Super excited to, to talk to you about that as well. So cool. Uh, so first off, you were born and raised in LA? Uh, I was born in Long Beach. Okay. Uh, and then when I was three, my parents moved to Grass Valley, California. Okay. You know, up in Northern California. Um, I, of course, went along with them because I was only three. <laughs> Would have been tough on the streets of Long yeah. Beach. Yeah. They you just know, left uh, you there. Uh, and then I, I lived there until I was like 21. So okay, Very there's, cool. a, there's a small dog that might walk across at some I point. I love it. It's all it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, how did you get into music? Uh, my dad is a musician. Okay. And, and I, uh, you know, so I grew up with, with music in the house. You know, he... He plays, um, he plays saxophone, he's played tenor sax, you know, since the fifties. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and he also plays, uh, keyboard and sings, plays a little guitar. And so, uh, you know, he would have band practices in the house, you know, when I was just a kid growing up and there was always instruments around. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was pretty natural for me to pick him up and want to, and want to play things. And then, um, and then, uh, in fourth grade, I joined the school band. Okay. Uh, playing clarinet, I wanted to play sax like my dad. Yeah. But, uh, but they told me that uh, that you know people who wanted to play saxophone at that age it was too heavy of an instrument, so they would play a, a year of clarinet. Okay. Looking back, I, I can't. I I have so much like um, empathy for the for the instructor who spent his you know tuesday afternoons with this group of fourth graders just barely being able to play notes and uh, sure it must have been so awful um but that just you know from there it just sort of snowballed i i then um you know was in school band all you know through high school and um and you know wanted to pick up guitar because it's a little cooler so and then from there i was like started bands and then in high school, any any band that existed um, in theory, like mm -hmm. if I talked to my friends and they were like, "Hey, we got a we got a band together, we just don't have a drummer," I'd be like, "You know what? I can I'll play figure it out. I'll play it." <laughs> yeah. So I was in a lot of bands in high school, like a lot of simultaneous bands. Okay. Sometimes there would be like a, a local show, and I'd be playing in like three of the bands. Wow. Wow. On the same bill? That's On the crazy. same bill. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> wow. 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 So we'll see. So you can play, obviously, a bunch of different instruments. What was, did you keep doing clarinet? Or is that the instrument you played through in the band? I, or did you move I to I immediately sax? threw it aside when I got, you know, when, the, the following year when I, when I was allowed to play saxophone. <laughs> okay. Um, but then, for, I think maybe when I was like 16 or 17, I asked for a clarinet for Christmas mm -hmm. and, and got one. And, um, and then I played a little bit. I haven't, honestly, I haven't played clarinet in probably like 15 years now. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but, but I still play sax and, um, and it's, it's, I think the last time I picked up the clarinet, I'm like, okay, that's still there. It's, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it wasn't as smooth as it, as it had been, but maybe it was smoother because, you know, anything is smoother than a fourth grade. <laughs> fourth grade <laughs> clarinet. <laughs> uh, did, was your dad like a pretty big advocate of you playing music? I mean, as a musician himself? Yeah, I mean, he was, you know, he wouldn't, he never pushed me into anything or, uh -huh. you know, um, but he was always like very encouraging and, um, and even went so far as to, um, in high school, to, to build a like a jam room inside our garage, like the wow. separate structure in a structure. So there, you know, um, at this point I had started, one of the bands that I'd started was with my sister and she was, she was a screamer. And, um, and so 
yeah, it was really cool because from that point until until I moved out, like that was the the place where every band I was in would practice. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm sure it was like, you know, I'm sure that all the neighbors loved it. It you know wasn't <laughs> totally soundproof. So sure, sure. Do you, uh, did you? Wow. So you played with your sister? Is is she still a musician at all? Or she is she? Um, she. I think she stopped screaming at some point, kind okay. of lost taste for that. Um, <laughs> and uh, and she started playing the musical saw. Interesting. And, yeah. And so and she's it's there's there's a lot of demand for musical saw out there, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so she's like a studio musician for musical saw. Uh, I don't know if she's done studio stuff, but um, I mean, maybe she has, but she, she plays in or played, I don't know, like over the last year or so, you know, things right. have been a bit weird. Um, <laughs> but she's, um, she's been performing for a long time with a, um, with like a, like a jug band. Really? Yeah. So that's cool. Actually there's, um, uh, gosh, this was like four years ago. I, I, she, she lived in Oakland at the time and mm -hmm. I, uh, went up to see one of her shows, uh, which was like at a coffee shop downtown. And as mm -hmm. soon as, as soon as they finished, as soon as her set was done, which it was awesome. Um, my parents also came to it. Um, we all walked like four blocks through downtown Oakland to a club where her boyfriend, who's in like a black metal band was, mm -hmm. was playing his first show with that project. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's like, awesome. Really cool. Like, like family two, affair <laughs> two completely different styles of music but it was, it was yeah it was really fun that's rad that's really rad um so well you said you're in, in a bunch of different bands um yeah. what which like how did you like were, were you in a band that ended up like leaving and touring or like what was like the how did your musical career kind of get going yeah it was um i mean most of the bands that i was in in high school kind of wrapped up around the time that high school was wrapping up mm -hmm. and I was set to go to uh to UC Santa Cruz and um and that was my whole like my parents made me pick some other colleges that I wanted to go to, or you know other like alternates I'm like nah, sure. I don't, don't want to go anywhere else that's where I want to go okay and and I got accepted and, and I was all set to go and they they like screwed up my dorm assignment and I, I had planned to, you know, be in the dorm where, uh, you know, where you're right next to the music, all the new music stuff, the mm -hmm. rehearsal places and what, what have you. And they had, had me somewhere weird that I like far mm -hmm. across campus. And I was just like not feeling it. I just had a weird vibe about it. And I decided that I didn't want to go at all. I'm like, you know what? I don't. I feel like my, my time here in Grass Valley isn't done yet. Uh -huh. And and so my mom was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right, well, let's let's have you write down a list of the things that you that you feel you want to accomplish. Like if you're not gonna go to, to UC Santa Cruz, like what mm -hmm. are you gonna do? Like what how are you gonna spend this time? Like, because you can't just sit around, you have to actually do stuff. Right. So I made a list of, like all you know, like um, you know, I would attend the the um the local like junior college which i did mm -hmm. um and then i at one point even attended um a, a neighboring junior college simultaneously so i was like try to you know continue my education in some in some um, regard um and then i had a number of other like things i don't even remember were on the list but one of the things was like i have to start a band with my friend matt who mm -hmm. was all in the scene that i was you know in and and we never had any bands together, but, but we were friends and, and liked a lot of the same music. And he was, um, had been the singer of a band called The Circus Tents. And uh, that band had broken up. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, this is a, this is a prime time to, to do this. So, I, so we got to talking, we started a band and um, I was playing drums. And we, um, we had another guy playing guitar who had been in a bunch of bands and we couldn't find a bass player. And it was just like driving us crazy. like nobody played bass for some reason mm -hmm. and so after a couple months i felt like this is this band isn't happening like we're just not getting anywhere um and we ran into a friend who another friend who played drums we we're kind of telling him our problems and then i got to thinking wait wait hold on hold on what if i played bass 
and you played drums. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so we did that. There's a, you know, a little, you know, a little switching around and, um, and we easily jumped on shows that I had already booked at, for another band that had broken up that I was in. Oh, uh, okay. And we kind of, we, I kind of like, we, you know, one of our sh- first shows was at, um, 924 Gilman Street. Wow. I had told them like, Hey, by the way, uh, uh we changed our name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the style's a little different than what you were expecting, <laughs> but it's, you know. And it's um, totally different members. It's, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, they don't care, whatever. Um, so, so that band, um, we got up to a quick start, and, uh-huh. um, and our singer, Matt, um, around that same time, also um, started a record label, and he became friends with AFI. Okay. And, and put out, uh, I guess... I guess not their first seven inch, but um, but the first seven inch that wasn't a, that wasn't self released. Okay. And um, as a result, he became their first uh, like de facto merch guy on tour. Oh wow! So um, so the rest of us, the rest of us in our band, were like waiting for them Matt to come home. He's like, oh, he's out with AFI. Jeez, like <laughs> when they come home, we gotta we got some shows to do. Right. Um, so that that progressed and our band progressed and it got to the point where we were we were recording and we were playing more shows and then we started playing shows with AFI. Mm-hmm. And um, and it was a it was a good fit, you know, the styles were um, you know similar enough that um, that it made sense at shows and mm-hmm. um, and that continued on for a while until one day I got a call from uh, from actually from Matt from florida he's with afi out on tour in florida he's like hey so um um, i was asked to to call you for this call because we're close friends um is there any chance that you would be interested in learning a bunch of afi songs to come out on tour wow (laughs) apparently the bass player was he was resigning Mm -hmm. and and they needed somebody for a tour that was like a month later and so I, uh, I was like in the middle, I was in the middle of arguably my most successful like academic semester where I had really, sh- I had really shifted my focus of classes from like really eclectic art stuff to like m- more um, career focused stuff, like academic um, type yeah, classes. And, <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, God, so I had to like quit. Like I really was connecting with my teachers. It was like, <laughs> It was feeling good and like you know what but uh but a tour as like yeah. a, as like a temporary fill-in guy with a tour around the country like i had never even been to to new york city mm-hmm. at that point in my life so it was like this was going to check off a lot of boxes and school seemed like something that wasn't going anywhere like school <laughs> will be there you could always go back to school right yeah. <laughs> so so yeah so i agreed to do that and um and I learned, yeah, I learned like, you know, a couple dozen songs and, um, and then, you know, immediately jumped into playing some of the, the biggest shows that I'd ever played. You know, like at, at that point, I, you know, the punk shows that, that, um, that I played in the force, you know, probably topped out at like 300 people was like the craziest show mm-hmm. we had played. Which is still pretty big, I mean. It's big. Yeah. And especially for the size venues, that was like a full venue for like- Right. Um, and now I'm playing 3,000 people. Whoa. <laughs> like, I don't know, like, okay. But it was a crash course in like trying to figure out how to, to like put on a bigger show. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the stage was huge. So it was like a lot of running around, which I had never had the space to do before. Um, and, um, hopefully no board mixes of any of that stuff exists. Cause I think, um, <laughs> at some point, um, especially after I had officially joined AFI, it was brought to our attention that we, all that running around and jumping looks cool, but we sound like shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, so I did the tour and then, um, I'm just taking you through the whole history. Um, I love it. No, this is that's what the the whole podcast is about, and I really appreciate you doing that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I did the tour, and uh, and that ended, and I it ended with like a, uh, I mean the whole the whole tour was with was with uh, L7 and the Offspring. Okay, I was going to ask you how you guys are playing. I it 
I mean, obviously AFI is huge, but you guys were signed to Nitro, and I was yeah. wondering if how you guys were playing three thousand. I mean, that's a big room. Yeah, no, it was all it was all the offspring. I mean, this is like ninety seven, so it was all the offspring's like cloud. Okay. Um, and uh, but we ended that tour with just a, a show with us and some like hardcore bands for, in Oakland. So it was okay. like, kind of brought it back down to reality. And, um, and it was cool. And I thought, well, that, that was awesome. I felt really good about this thing that I had done and, and all these friends that I had made. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the people that I met on that tour are still like really good friends today. So it, it was, it felt great. Um, and then I went back to, to like, you know, working in a movie theater and, and then playing, playing drums in another band, but then also like playing, you know, um, playing bass and recording with the force and, um that was the force being i guess i never dropped the name but that was the band before yeah the band prior um and um and then you know uh three months later afi calls me up and they're like hey we're we're uh writing a new record and we want to know if you want to play bass on on that record and i was like sure mm-hmm. hired gun in the studio of course <laughs> so we did that you know rehearsed for a while and went to the studio and 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 played on that record and then i thought okay well that's cool like that's there's that like you know every every little bit was just like this is awesome that i have an opportunity to, to like go into a mm-hmm. studio with a band and mm-hmm. um, was that with uh, shut your mouth and open your eyes yeah with that record okay yeah and it was so, you know same studio um art of ears um in hayward with with uh, andy ernst the same guy who had recorded uh the stuff that i did with the force mm-hmm. so it was like it was a really f- a familiar situation mm-hmm uh, and then a couple months later, it, there was like a one-off show. Like, hey, we're playing a show in Hollywood for this special thing. Like, can you come down and do that? And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is cool. It's a cool gig. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess apparently at the meanwhile, they were pursuing another person to be the ba- actual bass player. Oh, like, interesting. Um, and they had gone so far as to even take promo photos with him. Okay. Like, you know, hush, hush and whatever. Uh-huh. Um, so I continued to do my thing. And then um, for the release of Shut Your Mouth, uh, they asked The Force to come out as a, as a support act and do a whole tour. Wow. And, and we, The Force, had never done anything more than like maybe three shows in a row around California or anything. So it was like, this was like, oh yeah, okay. If everybody can get the time off work and you know, make it happen, if we, if we can find a vehicle, <laughs> <laughs> sure, that must have been yeah, yeah difficult in itself, right? And so, and then I was asked for that to play two sets back to back of like fast, <laughs> hardcore, <laughs> screaming, jumping. So I was totally into it. <laughs> um, and then that and that tour was great. Um, and uh, you know, we sort of just. Uh, I mean, it started in California and then we kind of worked our way across um, to, to like, I think maybe like New York or I think maybe New York was the last show or DC or Philly or somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then there was like one show that AFI had at the very end that the force couldn't do for, for whatever reason, mm-hmm. the force jumped back in the force car <laughs> and drove <laughs> drove home and then suddenly, forced their way home and then suddenly i was just with afi and it was at that show or you know on the at that point where they asked me hey would you want to be in this band like for reals oh wow and so that's was, when they asked you to join yeah. and i was like okay yeah i gotta talk to my people i gotta talk to the force people about this and it was just it was a little bit of a weird thing because it sort of seemed like it was like mm, is this like kind of i don't know um and then nobody took it well the the force guys were kind of bummed um Mm -hmm. and it's i mean it did you know everything is all mended with those guys um but um but it was like i think at this point matt had also pledged that he was going to stop touring with afi so it was finally going to be the chance for for the force to have it time to to really pursue it a gotcha Um, and I think just my then being gone for a long time also, um, I don't know, it also, 
made it easier for other members of, of the force to sort of um, use that as an excuse to do something. And then the, that's mm -hmm. not the show wasn't the priority. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's kind of how that happened. <laughs> wow. So when you're officially in the band, I mean, that was that that was probably a huge moment for you, I would assume, right? Yeah. I mean, it was like uh, we immediately jumped on a plane and went to Japan. Wow. Also with the offspring. OK. Uh, which, you know, which that like it's one thing to be like, hey, I'm going to New York for the first time and this is cool. But like to mm -hmm. go to Japan for the first time <laughs> and on this particular tour it was only like maybe like a week's worth of shows two weeks worth of shows something like that um but we played all these like like smaller cities like all over the country mm -hmm. um and we took a train to to most of them and and so i get to like look out the window at this like beautiful like japanese countryside in the winter with snow and it was like like a, out of a dream uh, in all the years since then that we have gone to Japan, we only play like, like Tokyo and Osaka. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> okay. <laughs> I've never been back to any of these places that I got to see. Uh, uh huh. So, but yeah, there's I mean, probably not a venue big enough to hold you guys anymore. <laughs> no, it's yeah. Um, I mean, I think most of the, most of the shows we end up playing in the in the years since are like big festivals and stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, it was wild. I mean, it, you know, it took a long time, I think, for me for it to sink in that, like, this is my band. I'm in this band, mm -hmm. especially playing, you know, for years, playing mostly the material that had been written before I was in the band. Sure. Um, it was a it was a long time before the set was more weighted to the stuff that I was involved in. Okay. So, Wow. And now we only like if we throw, you know, throw it back to one song from before I was in the band, I'm like, oh, it's awesome. We get to play like one of those songs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cause now it's all material that you obviously play on. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, tell me, you, so you put out, then you guys put out a, two more records with Nitro and then you signed to a, a major label. What was that like? Were, were the shows getting bigger? Like, how did you yeah, it was, guys um, get that, that opportunity? So the shows, were constantly getting bigger mm -hmm. um each time we would kind of return to a city or a venue i would notice we'd bump up you know a little bit either either to a bigger venue or you know more attendance mm -hmm. i remember one tour in it's probably like 99 um i remember <laughs> looking at our our itinerary and seeing that or like Maybe it was like looking at our attendance from the show or something. Something I was like, hey, this is the first tour where we no show that we that we played had fewer than a hundred people at it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, and then I mean, some of the cities we were playing to thousands at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, but but some of them were still like really, I remember like Minneapolis took a long time for us to really like kind of get over the hump of, of attendance. Mm -hmm. And I remember Boston was always really tough um for some reason it it was i don't know it took years for us to like really kind of get people there like excited mm -hmm. um but yeah it was like the shows continued to grow and then i feel like it, it, we got to a point where it seemed like the the growth of the shows was um was was larger than the growth of our record sales mm -hmm. um you know we had we had nothing to do in those days, like sitting in the van driving from show to show. So we would just like crunch the numbers, and, like <laughs> look at things, and and then we, you know, when we'd when we'd stop and you know when we'd get to the city where we were playing, we would, um, you know, we would load in. We we're always really punctual with like load in, we get there, unload the the van, get the stuff ready, and then we would like drive to an area where there's like record stores and stuff, and we'd check out the shops and we'd look and see if our records were in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they like weren't there. Oh. <laughs> but then we would see like bands that we were friends with who were like, you know, seemed like, um, you know, like good, um, like comparable size bands. Yeah. Um, like I'm trying to think of, um, I don't know, like H2O. Okay. We would look and be like, oh, tons of H2O records. And, you know, um, and so it was like, oh, is this just like a problem with like our record label <laughs> or is it like, 
what it, you know, I think maybe their distribution wasn't as as good as we had sort of hoped it would be or wanted mm -hmm. it to be. Um, but as a result, like there was kind of this sort of secret demand for our records out in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so then when we when we did the Warp Tour shows, I guess we did some in 2000, then we did some in 2001. Like we did the whole thing in 2001. Uh -huh. And it was that, um, that was our first chance to really get, um, I guess this would be The Art of Drowning, mm -hmm. in people's hands. We had them. We had the records with us. They couldn't get them in the stores. Here uh -huh. they were down. So that like really boosted our record sales quite a bit. And, um, and I think that, I mean, not that we weren't on the radar of, of like major labels and stuff, but I think that, that those like that boost in sales really showed up on their radars mm -hmm. as like, oh, here's a, here's a thing. Their numbers are great when they play the, you know, when they play concerts, their sales are through the roof. These guys, we've got to check out. Right. Uh, so then, yeah, so we started getting, um, you know, a lot of attention from, from labels and we were still technically signed to nitro mm -hmm. i still owed them one more record um but uh but we had a, a meeting with them and they were like hey yeah you guys are ready to to move on to the next level you know mm -hmm. um so you have our blessing and and uh i mean then of course we get a piece of the next level oh <laughs> sure sure uh, all that stuff works but um yeah so uh so then yeah so then we it took forever and like it's it's wild to me like to think back now and like the amount of like the amount of like time that we put into to like meeting with all these labels and really deciding what was going to be the best home for us um and it was really important that like we found a label that was that was going to be sort of um artist forward and give us like the creative control that we wanted um and uh yeah so we ended up signing to dreamworks Mm -hmm. which then s sold like, itself right didn't they sell like immediately after that because yeah. <laughs> a lot of bands got lost in the shuffle there when they left right did interscope yeah. buy them i can't remember yeah i mean it was so it was like sold to um it was sold to universal uh-huh and then would be most bands sort of um fell under the geffen umbrella yeah okay which, and it's at this point in time geffen and interscope were two separate things under the same i don't know it's, it's so complicated sure sure um, we were held off on to because of our our a and r guy became like um moved over was one of the main people that moved over he moved over to interscope and so we stayed with him on the interscope side oh that's cool yeah because i i mean the geffen side yeah because but a lot of bands got like saves the day for example was a band that kind of got they got yeah. pushed to the side and shelved for a while um but i mean they were smart to hold on to you guys obviously i mean that record is massive i yeah. remember seeing like when you were like not for girls not gray i mean i was a fan of afi prior to that record coming out and then you guys are on the vmas i'm like oh my god afi is on the, like what is ha like it just blew my mind i mean that must have blown your guys mind too obviously yeah it was like like i was saying every, everything was sort of growing and building and it just this wild upward trajectory and so yeah suddenly suddenly we we're working with like these a-list producers mm -hmm. like not just jerry finn or butch vig but jerry finn and butch vig <laughs> on one record and not like jerry finn on some songs and butch on some on some other songs but like both of them in the room together so crazy so, you know, just all these all these like um every every rock band fantasy that I ever had was all of a sudden like just happening. Right. Um, yeah, we're at the VMAs and like, and not just at the VMAs, but like nominating playing. and then and not playing, just nominating, but winning. <laughs> right. So yeah, it's, it was, that was a really, really wild time. And I remember people around us were like, Hey, you got to remember this time. Like, <laughs> like, you know, you're going to look back and this is going to be like the craziest time. You're going to want to remember all this. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll remember all this. It's fine. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it was, it was awesome. That is cool. But I mean, even the next record, you, you guys even achieved even more success, right? With December underground, it was like, you are huge. I mean, was it hard to kind of 
was there a thought in your mind at that point being like, are we going to be able to sustain and like follow this record up? I mean, having that much attention. I think that, yeah. I mean, I think that there, um, there's no way to avoid that. Like seeing how things had been growing, like I said, throughout our entire career mm -hmm. um, and having Sing the Sorrow hit the charts at, at number five and be like, this is, this is, I, I don't even, I think the, the record before that was like, you know, maybe broke the top hundred, like mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe not, maybe the top 200. And then suddenly <laughs> we have a record that's number five and, and then all these things are happening. So um, yeah, there was, I mean, you know, fortunately the label didn't put any pressure on us. Nobody put any, nobody put any more pressure on us than we put on ourselves. And it wasn't like, I don't know it wasn't like write some hit songs it was like mm -hmm. just this just this pressure to like i don't know we were more aware of of that sort of thing and it's like you know um it's you, when you hit number five on the charts i mean not to use this one metric but like um there's not much room to go up from there and it's really tough competition mm -hmm. ahead of five um so and i think also at the time we you know we didn't everything was sort of a new landscape in terms of um resources and and things so before we had always just like jammed out all our songs in like a tiny little sweaty room and now we have like we can you know uh we can rent this studio for a month just to just to work on songs and then go to another place and you know it was just like so we hadn't quite I think figured out the the most like um efficient way to use all these resources but we're trying everything right and spending longer in the studio than we'd ever spent before um and then you know and then of course still kind of second guessing like what do we have here is this is this a good record is this a hit do these songs make sense together mm -hmm. and of course like you know when you're in the um when you're in the process of writing songs and making music, everything like something that seems like really out of your element is probably still very much in your element from an outside perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like like I would I would play a song for somebody and be like, listen to the song, it sounds weird, right? It sounds like it doesn't sound anything like us. And the person would be like, mm, it sounds exactly like you. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And especially because we, you know, had sort of evolved our sound from the beginning to mm -hmm. be, you know, um, to s sort of continue to move forward and, and, and change. So, um, but then, yeah, then the record came out and it, and it debuted at number one. Right. I was going to say, you said we're at five, like there's yeah. really nowhere to go, but it's like, but then you did, <laughs> you went up to the very top slot. Yeah. Um, from number one, there really is nowhere to go. No. Like zero. <laughs> right. I never want the record to come out at number zero. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, but then, um, you know, as all great, all great success stories, something has to, something has to dip a little bit and the next record wasn't as, as successful. Uh, a lot of, a lot of things, I mean, We've, we've, I love that record to be honest. We've was... sat in in like the in like the backstage area shows and and talked about like you know in retrospect like what what different factors you know were at play uh, you know at that time and there's just so many different things were happening um, and so it's hard to just say that like you know for one reason or another it's a different kind of record. Uh, changing audiences three years from record to record, uh, the uh, the sort of devaluation of albums and music in in you know in general across the across the whole marketplace. You know now mm -hmm. now people were just getting music for free, so why would they place value on one thing or another? I don't know. Sure, a whole bunch of different factors, but we we made a cool rock record and mm -hmm. uh, and it debuted at like number nine. So, which is still but, in the top 10. Sure. And I was going to say, I had just started, I, I've been in radio for 16 years. I've, we've crossed paths a few times at different stations I've been at, but I had just started working at Live 105 in San Francisco and you guys put out that record and we were playing Medicaid. And I was like, this song is so good. Like, I was just blown away. But that's still one of my favorite songs of yours. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I love that record. It's, it's, it has, I mean, I think people ask me like, what's your favorite song to play live? And I'm like, I don't know, I like, I like every song. I also right. like any song that we haven't played in a while. Um, but, but usually I will say, uh, and transmission from that. Record. Oh yeah. That's a great song. Just, I think like, oh man, I don't know why that wasn't like, we didn't have that as a single. I mean, the whole, the whole thing was also our record contract with, with Interscope had come to an end at that mm -hmm. point. Okay. And, and I don't think they were interested in promoting a band at all. I think they had just moved on to like, you know, pop, pop artists completely. So, so yeah, I mean, it was, you know, I don't know. It was, it was the end of an era, the mm -hmm. 2000s. <laughs> sure. Uh, and then you guys, from there, you moved on to Republic and put out Burials, which is another amazing yeah. record. And um, what would you say like the milestone of, of that album would be? Uh, burials. Uh huh. Uh, I mean, we. It it felt like an eternity between Crash Love and Burials. Like, I don't even know how long it was, but I think it was like four years. It was like four or five years, or four yeah. years, I think, before and, you put that. And during out. that time, like we did, there was a there was a period of time where we did nothing as a band, mm -hmm. and um, and because of this this sort of void of band related stuff none of us were like totally sure that like we were still going to do stuff as a band you know i think we'd all just kind of like decided to do something that wasn't that you know mm -hmm. uh, which is good it's kind of healthy like <laughs> it, we'd been going non-stop for you know 15 years of just like record and tour and record and tour mm -hmm. and doing stuff and like putting everything else on hold so it was like okay let's just do let's do whatever we want to do um <laughs> and then and then so coming back from that from that void and coming together and playing was like oh this is cool like mm -hmm. like it was um it was it felt like almost like a reunion um which is weird it's only been a couple of years and yeah you know, but still it was like i remember that first time we got together in in like a rehearsal room and set up our gear i'm like this is cool like i'm wonderful <laughs> I wonder if any of us remember the old songs. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. But then that was, you know, I think we then, I think one, you know, that, that record was like a much darker record. Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of where we were all sort of mentally just thinking like, this is, this is how we need to express ourselves mm -hmm. at this point in time. This is what's going to like be the most cathartic for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and um yeah and that was i don't know that was that was a fun record and then it was another four years or so before you put out the the self-titled or the most recent up until the ones coming out yeah. on friday uh did you guys have that same did you have that same feeling when you came back into that album or was it no not as much i think maybe because we had sort of s sort of reset the pace mm -hmm. um to expect a little bit of downtime and like a little bit of um I think also our, our touring throughout that cycle was a little, um, it was a little less intense and a little more um, spread out over the time mm -hmm. instead of maybe our previous method, which is like records out, go, 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 go. Right, right. Um, so yeah, um, I'm trying to think about that. <laughs> trying to think of like when we first got, I don't know, it's, it was a little less. I think we just had, had seen a little more of each other mm -hmm. throughout that that process, and 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 also like talked about what was coming up next too. Okay. That's a big thing. Yeah. Um, post crash love, there was just a period of time where we were like just weren't talking about it. So, um, yeah. Um, and then there was. Oh. I was gonna, sorry. I was just gonna ask. Was that? I can't remember. I remember seeing you with Matt Skiba and the Secrets at bottom of the hill in San Francisco. Were you in that, was that kind of, were you in that band during that time period or? I... Yeah, so. Okay. That, yeah, okay, so like when, oh gosh, that was, <laughs> is that when that was? I think so. I think that, so. Was, I think I that was pre, that was pre-burials. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So it must have been in that, that crash love, between crash love and burials. Yeah, time in that, yeah, so in that time I played with, I played with um, Matt Skiba and the Secrets, mm -hmm. I played with, cold cave i oh, did wow. kind of like a lot of 
the other stuff. Um, I think also, um, I don't know if Tegan from Tegan and Sarah, I think we were. Oh, you did, you did the con, before. right? You were on the con album? Yeah, I was on, I was on the con and then we had written some songs together and then they eventually, um, they, they recorded three of the songs that we had, uh, that T and I had, had written together on Sainthood, which was like also 09. Um, yeah, that's the one that had hell on it, I think. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then T and I continued to kind of, um, kind of, oh man, <laughs> I just, I just talked, Tegan is, is, uh, is, you know, that like T and Sarah are so prolific, constantly doing things, constantly doing <laughs> like, Thing, projects across all media and they're working on another book or something oh really and so she just called me like a week ago to help her sort of remember the timeline of some of this stuff and oh, now that's awesome gone right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so so yeah so working on a lot of stuff in that period um the uh but but yeah so between um okay so oh this is what i was gonna say is when the self-titled album came out that especially when we started playing the shows on it i started to get a different sense about the band and it was kind of cool like and i'll explain it i think okay. at this point a lot of what we had done was either um playing support shows where we're like really fighting to get the attention of these of like young audiences and like just really like you know connect with people that don't know who we are we're trying to win you over or playing our own headlining shows where, where, um, you know, it's all just, you know, people know us and they know that the, right. it's, it's our, our moment to, to, to show what we do. Um, and then I think now at this point at the shows, I was seeing a lot of, um, a lot of people who had come to see us, 10 years or, or or more prior and maybe stopped coming to the shows but now I come back to the shows some of them have their kids now mm -hmm. and it was like okay i get it now we're like now we're like a little older and a little wiser and we can we can bring you this thing that like you're you're nostalgic about but i don't you know we didn't we never want to be the ones to sort of like 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 beat a horse to death and like do do an old thing um mm -hmm. or beat a dead horse i guess <laughs> okay first off we don't want to beat a horse to death we don't, <laughs> we don't beat a dead horse <laughs> there should be no horse abuse at all in any of this um but yeah but it was like um you know i, I felt like there was a now there was a, it, it felt like there was a place for the the older stuff that wasn't like um i don't know not like pandering but like but um but just a way to connect with certain members of the audience but then also a place for the new stuff with the younger audiences too mm -hmm. i don't know just it somehow it clicked for me it was made more sense and around this time we started to do something that i love and will forever advocate for is mixing up our set list every single night spreading cool. across all albums mm -hmm. pulling out secret tracks from the past stuff we haven't played in a while stuff we've never played before mm -hmm. um because now we're like i'm saying now we have all these generations to connect with um but we also have ourselves to connect with <laughs> um and it's as much as like you know you or somebody who comes to a show and is excited to hear this song that like, we've never played or whatever for mm -hmm. us like that's so huge. It's so huge to be able to play different and new songs that, um, that, you know, that keep us engaged in the performance while we're playing them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of my favorite things is to, is to like look at a set list while we're on stage, see a song that I hadn't realized was on the set list <laughs> and have to go, oh shit, like, I know, do I remember this? I, this? I got, I got this, like, the whole time in the song, I'm like, I'm fully engaged in the performance because it's like, it's, I mean, it's, it's exciting to hear that song, to be playing that song that, that like, I didn't even realize we were going to play, but also like, just try to remember it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's so much, 
I don't know, it's so much better for us performing wise than to do the, the super robotic set where it's like the same 10 songs every night and or 15 songs. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I get to where I'm like not thinking about the songs. It's all muscle memory. I'm just like my brain's somewhere else. Like I'd mm -hmm. rather have to be there at the show. Mm -hmm. So yeah, even if it, if it means we're going to like mess up every once in a while. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> They're just happy you're playing that old song or that yeah. song they've never heard live. Yeah, it was that must be a, a difficult task to even, you know, thumb through 10 albums and EPs worth of, you know, of music and material to be like, okay, let's put together something. Cause you could always just do the hits, but yeah. you know, to it's yeah, some of my favorite shows were the ones where we left off Miss Murder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like we're good. We don't need to play that song. People yeah. play it, it goes. Um, <laughs> I think um yeah, I, I can I can remember specifically a couple of the dates on that tour. Like there's one we were playing just outside or in like some area of Atlanta. And I knew that I had, you know, 20 minutes before sound check and Jade texts me like, do you know this song? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, I don't but i will i'll figure and, it out like, and i just like you know put in my earbuds and walk to a coffee shop and i'm just listening to it over and over again and i'm hearing it and i'm go okay this is an obscure song that i don't even remember recording but i'm hearing it it sounds like me playing on it and, it, <laughs> and so it's um i get to it's uh, I mean, how do i explain this i approach it by thinking what would 20 years ago hunter have done like how did how did that how did that version of me approach uh this chord progression and it's like knowing like what my tendencies were back then helps me sort of figure out like the main riff okay i get it and then also knowing that like generally my tendency is to um is to put patterns into my bass lines like there's a certain way that i'll do things and it'll either it'll you'll be like um repeated exactly the same twice or there'll be or it'll be like each time i'll add one note so one note two extra notes three extra notes four extra notes and so there's there's like i always put a logic to it it won't just okay. be like completely random unless the logic is that it's completely random <laughs> <laughs> some of the songs are like that uh -huh. so it is but it's weird it's like getting to like um it's like having a, a conversation with a younger version of yourself you know yeah it's, like what would younger hunter be doing here <laughs> yeah. um and uh i also have to i'm gonna can i can i send a shout out to somebody of course you can okay. do whatever you want there's a um there's a, a guy who does these amazing um like bass like covers of our songs his name okay. is Ethan Condax. Um, and I have turned to his videos like more times than I want to admit to relearn songs that I wrote. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's, and, and he's, I mean, he's, he's like, um, incredibly accurate. Some of his stuff isn't like a hundred percent, Okay. but it would be enough to where I go like, okay. Like in, in watching him play it or seeing, I go, I go like, okay that's not right but because i know that that's not right i know that what the right part is <laughs> okay <laughs> um yeah he's been he's been great and i actually got to meet up with him and um he he's he lives in canada i think but um but he he went to one of our shows in san diego uh on the blood tour i think it was on the blood tour that's and, where uh, I, I wonder what show that is because i probably was at that show that's where yeah. i was born and raised and, aside from uh, living in san francisco for a little bit to work at live i was at 91x for a lot of years oh nice yeah um uh, yeah so I, re I remember uh i remember chatting with him after one of those shows and actually like going note by note to him, like okay this is how this baseline goes this you know <laughs> just like working while it was fresh in my mind working with him to like know exactly how it went um mm -hmm. so um yeah that's been a that's been an important re resource for me and for any other bass players out there that want to know my bass lines, it's like mostly all there. Mostly, mostly. I'll give them some credit, not yeah. all. Credit. <laughs> but that's amazing that you're able to reference it. <laughs> I'm sure that he is probably so stoked that uh, he, you know he's that you're able to even yeah. find his videos and have yeah. that relationship. Now that's so cool. Um, well, I want to know where you were at when this whole pandemic hit because you guys have a new record coming out in two days. 
um what what was going on like was was this album wrote or, you know written done. it was done yeah, it was okay. all done. we had done it in a in a sort of um a relatively pandemic friendly way okay <laughs> we had all just kind of done like i i uh i tracked all my bass at at my home studio okay easy um yeah it was all it, everything was done and and mastered by the time uh the pandemic really took hold whoa um, so yeah we kind of had to decide what to do we had a you know we had a tour booked and you know a, a much earlier release plan and we had to sort of figure out how to how to make that work and obviously nobody knew mm -hmm. what was going to happen with the pandemic and um so it was a while before we kind of had a plan for what we actually wanted to do with it but um you know our favorite thing is has been always to release a record and immediately play shows and bring those songs to people in a live format. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm really sad that we don't get to do that this time. It feels weird. It feels like, <laughs> I don't know, it feels incomplete. Yeah. But, but we do have, you know, we do have some shows that we are booking on the horizon that, um, you know, I, I'm not at liberty to announce at this moment in time. Sure. But um, yeah. But yeah, things are opening up. So I was hopefully, you know, the album coming out, maybe you can, you will be able to play these songs, I would hope in the near future. Oh yeah, I mean, the songs exist now. So, uh -huh. so you know, whenever whenever we are able to play shows to come to, to you know, cities across the world, uh, we will bring these songs with us. I love that. If we can, if we can remember how to play them. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so. That's also a thing like, all these songs i haven't i mean i guess i've played them like we we've done some videos and stuff so i've sort of relearned some of them but some of these songs i haven't even tried to play in over a year and a half wow so, so be... in the in the midst of you know finishing the re record and recording it and having it all done like prior to this whole pandemic hitting um you guys obviously weren't able to get together and play really um were you working like what has have you been working on your own stuff? Like, what have you done over the course of the year? Like, oh man, <laughs> I'm just curious. I, mean. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I watched a lot of television. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Rest, oh. I'm sure. Playing on the road for X amount of years. Yeah, uh, this, you know, as you know, being being at home for a year is a great opportunity to, um, to broaden one's horizons. Sure. Um, to learn a new instrument, to, um, you know, get really buff, to do something. <laughs> Didn't do any of those things. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, I will say that I, um, I started off really strong. I did a bunch of, of jigsaw puzzles. Okay. And, which is something that like is one of my mom's favorite things to do. So, you know, uh, in the tradition, I decided to do some of those. Actually, my mom and I like would mail puzzles back and forth to each other. Oh, wow. Swap them around. Really tricky ones, you know. Yeah. What was the highest pieces you got to? Well, we, thousand? We, we always do a thousand, like a thousand oh, okay. thing. But but some of them, it's it's about what, you know, the what the image is. Sure. And like years ago, I would challenge her with some like just really tough ones, you know. <laughs> um, and I think there's one, there's one, there was one that she was trying that I specifically asked her to not send me. It was like <laughs> a thousand pieces, but it was like miniature. Okay. And all the pieces like look the same or something. There's some weird, oh, I don't know, just just a nightmare. So that's there's a balance between like being difficult and being just like not fun. And so, right. <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, but I, I did do some more productive things with my time other than that. Um, I love it. Just, you know, I, I've, I've the last couple of years, I've been focusing a little more on, on producing music for other artists. Mm -hmm. And so some of that I was able to continue during this time. Some of them I, I wasn't able to just because, you know, without the ability to do in-person stuff, it kind of um, hindered that, mm -hmm. but some of it I was able to do, and that's kind of coming along. Um, what else? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We have a record coming out, so that's exciting. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's, prepare for that, I guess. Um, we, we, we 
we once once there was a um, a specific like CDC protocol for health and safety in place, and we knew kind of what the what the you know the best you know practices were for for doing things, we as AFI were able to um, you know try to try to work around that to do things you know whether it be like a, a completely socially distanced like. Uh, photo shoot or mm -hmm. video shoot or whatever so all the all the video things that you see and, and you know and I guess we'll see coming out are all kind of done within that within that time um, so that's you know uh, I will say this though over the last year I got to relax and that's something that <laughs> I got to relax and not think about things mm -hmm. <laughs> or just <laughs> completely stress out about the state of the world and politics. Sure. You know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm super excited to hear the record. You guys really, I love on your website how you have the track listings up and then like the ones that haven't been released, you can't click on yet. They're ghosted. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty cool. I, I think that's also, really rad. How much of the album's already out? majority of it yeah. <laughs> i think there's four songs left <laughs> but still people check out this brand new album on friday the mm -hmm. whole thing yeah that's exciting what you, are there what out of the of all the songs like what was you, what would you say your favorite one is if you could even pinpoint that oh i don't know it's <laughs> i know it's uh, a difficult weird question i but really I'm curious like, um, <laughs> i really like dulceria a lot Okay. It's um, it's a very bass forward song, in a way that we haven't really done in the past, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a chance for me to kind of do a lot of um, I don't know, a lot of ch like bass kind of stuff that uh, I don't know. It's uh, like kind of a little um, a little funkier bass mm -hmm. thing that I that I always love to sort of you know put into songs. Um, this is a a chance for that to really shine. Okay. Um. Plus, it's really catchy and, yeah. you know, gets stuck in my head all the time. Is that the one that was co-written with Billy Corgan? Yeah. Okay. Which, which I didn't even find out until like a month ago. Really? That song had been like, had been written and recorded and in the in the bag and in the in the can and the whatever, <laughs> done, sure. ready to go, sent out, you know, music video done, everything done. And then I, then I heard that. That about that so yeah <laughs> that's awesome but, but I'm a player, so you know sometimes i'm the last to know the last to find out <laughs> well hunter thank you so much man for for talking to me especially for this long man i really appreciate it this yeah, has been yeah, so much course, fun um i do have one more question before i let you go i'm just curious if you have any advice for aspiring artists uh yeah i mean yeah i do okay so, um <laughs> I think my my number one thing that I always sort of um, sort of push is that like I'll, I find a lot of people what whether it's being a musician or whatever artist that they're like they are interested in this thing and they they want to be a, this I want to be a you know a bass player or I want to be a painter and I'm just I just mess around I'm not like um, I think that people it would benefit from just realizing they already are a painter. You already are a bass player. You already, you already are doing that thing. So you got to think of yourself as that thing, and go out of the world as if you are a bass player. I mean, that's what I did in every band <laughs> that I've been in. I, you know, I told that band that I was a drummer, even though I hadn't really played drums, because because then I knew that it would push me to be a better drummer, to re to learn more, and 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 to to perform at my highest ability at all times, you know? Um, you know, it's, it's, I think if you are just, you know, thinking proactively about these things, um, then you will push that out into the world. Um, and if you, but if you're sort of kind of questioning it or timid about it, then, then you'll always live in that sort of space. So I feel like it's the, it's the fake it till you make it just, you know, uh, dress for the job you want. It's all that it's, you know, it's just be, be the thing that you are, you are that thing, you know, it's a little bit of also the wizard of Oz, like the wizard, like, listen, you've had it inside you all along. 
So just go. <laughs> Bring it back,